Welcome back to Financially Incorrect, a podcast where we have a cheeky take on serious financial topics. This is a podcast sponsored by FX Pesa, and today I have a really interesting guest with me today. Um, her name is Anna Joroge. She has a hyphen name which she sometimes accepts, sometimes doesn't, Karuya. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Wydera Beauty, which is a skincare, fragrance, and beauty line. She's also the CEO of Masai Kenya, which is a CEO, yes, CEO of Masai Kenya, which is a hair product company, right? So, warm welcome for Anna. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Barak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what do you want to tell people about yourself to start off? Ooh. I am limitless. Limitless. I am a paradox. Yes. I believe every person should pursue who they are. Yeah. So I come from a financial background, uh, born and raised in Akuro, uh, went to the US, start, studied finance, what Fortune 500 in finance. Mm -hmm. After 16 years, decided to come back home mm -hmm. and I founded a brand. So what I want to tell people is whatever your dream is, yeah. Go get it. Pursue it. Never, ever be afraid to be the person that you are meant to be. And that's why I say be limitless. Yeah. Because only then, when you embrace everything that you are, can you realize your true potential. Yeah. And I think so many times we spend time trying to be like other people. But I can never be you, Barak. Yeah. And you can never be me. That's true. So we need to leverage on our own strengths. Yeah and push that to the limit yeah because our power and greatness yeah. lies in our uniqueness it sounds like a ted talk <laughs> um <laughs> anyway so we were having a conversation i guess for for for, for, for the listeners and watches we we're having a conversation before this started of course and um uh, anna told me something that i've never heard from anyone else before she told me she has received five proposals <laughs> wedding proposals i might add or marriage proposals um, um, and, and, and she turned obviously four of them down up until the person that she's, she's married and now, and I, I have never met anyone else who's had five proposals. How would you go about getting yourself five proposals? <sighs> Being me. Uh -huh. And it's actually not about getting five proposals. It's everything I have set out to do. Yeah. I do a hundred, actually I do 150% or I don't do it at all. Uh -huh. So I guess when I am with someone, I am, I was a good girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Um, and they thought that this is, might make a good wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh -huh, I do make a good wife, mm -hmm. but just not the good wife mm -hmm. to that person. The one thing I've always been very good at, and actually it's not something I thought about when I was younger, it's something I have reflected upon as I'm older. I've always been very, very clear about who I was. Okay. And I've never been ashamed. I tell people I have never fit in, mm -hmm. but I have never had a desire to fit in either. Never. Ever. Not primary, not high school, nope. not. I never had the desire yeah. to fit in. Yeah. So I would be in these relationships and I am a good girlfriend in the moment, but I also know that this is not a long term thing. Yeah. And what do I mean by that? It's two ways. They, there's something they're expecting out of me because mm -hmm. I also get to know them well that mm -hmm. I know I can't give them. Yeah. Or there's something I might be expecting out of them, and by me dating them, I know they will never give me. Yeah. So I already know this is relationship is not going to work out. And I don't compromise. I don't believe in going to something just because I'm supposed to get married. Yeah. So marriage for me was never a priority. So how did you turn them down? Like, did you say no? Yeah. Were any of them public? Were any of them public I'm proposals? Cold. Don't do a public proposal. I think enough of them knew about me well enough yeah. to not make it public. Okay. Please don't go on, uh, <laughs> you know, whatever and bend a knee in public. Because but so then, what do you say? Do you tell the guy like, like no. get up, like, like get up from your knees? Yeah. Pl please, no, no. And then what? <laughs> <laughs> then what happens thereafter? Like, uh, do you, like is the, the relationship, relationship is over ends. like at yes, that point yes. with immediate effect? Uh, really, Barack, as a man, <laughs> would you stay? <laughs> I mean, you know, maybe if my wife had told me, um, like, not yet, which she did actually, she not did. not not on my proposal, not uh -huh. on my proposal, but I mean, said you know, like, not not now, not now, not now. Um, but eventually, um, um, when she did, she accepted. So I don't know. It depends on the person. It depends on, I guess, what your response is going to be. So if it was like, if your response is like, 
hostile almost, then yeah, you know, you it, leave, I guess. It's never hostile because yeah. it's not meant to, you know, it, it's not meant at you. Yeah. I actually, a lot of them I liked. Yeah. And I loved. Yeah. Just not long term. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. In the moment, it's okay. fabulous. And yeah. it's, I also believe in treating people the way you want to be treated. Okay. So don't be mean about it. Yeah. And the thing is, with most men, mm -hmm. and I'll be honest, yeah. if you went on bending knee mm -hmm. and said, will you marry me? And she said no. Yeah. Your ego is bruised. <laughs> True or false? You know, honestly, I don't know because <laughs> I've, I guess, you know, technically speaking, I've had one proposal which mm -hmm. was accepted. I don't know... Um, and, and, and I'd like to think that, uh, maybe I'm romanticizing it, but I'd like to think that if I really felt a specific way about a person, maybe I'd make it work, but I, I honestly don't know. But, but I definitely, I mean, I also don't know what effect my ego would have. And, definitely and we, bruised, we all have for ego, sure. both yeah. women and men. Yeah. Everybody has an ego yeah. and it gets bruised. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes even when a woman is dumped and she's struggling with it, sometimes it actually has nothing to do with the man. It's yeah. the fact that... She was rejected. Yeah. And that's her ego. Yeah. It's not about who the person Sinus. was. And that's what you have to look at. And a lot of them actually, a lot of them are my friends still, except <laughs> for one. <laughs> Your ex proposes. Yes, uh, my proposes. ex proposes <laughs> or proposes, whatever, whatever they are. The word is, yeah. After time, of course, yes, yeah. they became friends. Because okay. it was never something that negative was meant to be or a bad relationship. Okay. It was just what it was. And eventually, they are all happily married. Yeah. Um, except for one. Uh, but I was very mean with that one. So yeah. I can understand. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> all right. Let's get into why we're actually here. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe just to start off, I can ask, um, what was it like growing up um, um, in, in Nakuru? You told me how old you are. I'm not going to say it here. But what was it like growing up uh, in Nakuru then? I am proudly my age. Oh, you are? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. So that was four, four decades ago, right? I know. Almost so was, five. Almost five, yeah. So how, how was it growing up in a crew then? It was amazing. So I grew up in a place called Solai. Mm -hmm. uh, not the Solai everybody knows from the dam, mm -hmm. but kind of you and to head towards that when they go towards the mountain. Okay. And uh, lived in the village, uh, but my parents were civil servants. Okay. So when you live in the village and your parents are civil servants, you guys are the, the cream. The cream. <laughs> You actually never <laughs> well, realize, your, your wait, were, were until you come back to, you come to Nairobi and you're like, whoa, people, wait, it's different. Yeah. However, I actually do appreciate having grown up there because okay. there's a lot of hang-ups mm -hmm. that I feel like people who grew up in Nairobi have mm -hmm. that I never did mm -hmm. because for me, we were it. Yeah. And by the time I'm realizing we are not it, yeah. uh, I'm already old enough yeah. to know better. Okay. So, grew up there. My parents were always present. They're the most amazing humans. Yes, they make mistakes, mm -hmm. and many, and we talk about it mm -hmm. now. And I usually say the word that for me has become gold mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. My parents never told me I can't. Mm -hmm. That word, mm -hmm. they never used. Mm -hmm. So, yes, do I know what it means in the English language? Yes. But it doesn't exist in my vocabulary. Yeah. Because I believe I can do whatever I want to do. Yeah. If I apply, yeah. I will do. And that's what they taught me. Okay. So for me, that was very important and comes to be this human that I have developed and become. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk about, um, we've just mentioned that um, in, in, in a crew, um, I guess your parents being civil servants and you guys being in shags for all intents and purposes, um, you guys were it. And, and, you know, coming to the city, um, you realize that's not the case. What, what, what is the definition of that it? Like <laughs> That it is, people are driving Mercedes yeah. Benzes, and yeah. they're your age at 19 years old. Yeah. And you get to visit them in places like Kavunda and yeah. Lavington. I, I make this joke, mm -hmm. and I say, I live in Lavington right now. Yeah. And uh, I talk about St. Austin's. And, and I make St. Austin's Academy. Of, yes, St. Austin's Academy. Yeah. The first time I needed to come, so I went to college in the US. Okay. And at the time I needed to sit for my SATs. Mm -hmm. Ooh, this is how old I am. Mm -hmm. At the time, only two places could you get your SAT forms mm -hmm. to fill out. Mm -hmm. And that was St. Austin's Academy mm -hmm. and USIU. Mm -hmm. And Thicker Road sounded like it was, whoa. It was another. In the, a whole other continent. Yeah. 
So I went to St. Austin's. And I remember coming by Matatu. I can't even tell you which Matatu it was. Mm -hmm. But I remember walking on James Kishoro mm -hmm. and going to St. Austin's and remember seeing the trees and wondering, wow. Who live like this? Mm -hmm. This is Lavington before mm -hmm. the apartments all, all the, all and all the, the yeah. development. Yeah. This is when you the still had the, yes, the leafy suburbs. Yeah. And now I walk around that roundabout and I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that actually was my first, oh wow, people live like this? Yeah. Yes. So was that like your your eye-opening um well, it could have been your eye-opening moment, but was that a, a moment where you were like, okay, there's different types of money um, I'm over here? I, I actually never thought it actually, it, it never registered about money. Okay. So I had already decided I wanted to go to the U.S. Okay. That's why I'm picking up my SAT forms to fill mm -hmm. them out. You actually needed to fill them out in paper form mm -hmm. and mail them. Yeah. And for me, my mother is an avid reader. So mm -hmm. my mom was a teacher. Mm -hmm. She's an avid reader. And she exposed us to this world of books. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, I want to visit mm -hmm. these places. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the novels we read at the time were American written novels. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want to go explore. It, it was really never about the money. Mm -hmm. And I have this relationship with money to this day, which is pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I won't say I don't love it. Mm -hmm. I love money like everybody else. Mm -hmm. But for me, I love it from the perspective that it allows me mm -hmm. to do the things that I love mm -hmm. to do. It gives me access. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, wow, if I had this much money, then yeah. I can go around the world and travel and do different things, which is yeah. one of my passions and help people and give back. Yeah. Yes. When do you think you first had that conscious realization? that you've talked about, you know, money and access? I think the first realization of money access actually happened maybe in college. Okay. I'll actually say in the U.S. So That's the first yeah. time it actually, the whole realization of money and access uh -huh. happened in college. And uh -huh. it happened me being in the U.S. And me wanting something that maybe I can't afford okay. in the moment. And yeah. I'm like, well, I need to get a job so I can access this. Whatever, Whatever items you wanted to purchase. Be. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's, so, so, I mean, so you're pretty, technically pretty old by the time you're realizing that money like moves or having a conscious realization it's, that it's money moves. It's a conscious moves. realization yeah. that money moves. So how did things. you then choose your, your, your career path or what you decided to study? It had nothing to do with financial gain, no, nothing to do with. It actually pretty, when I left Kenya and went to the US, mm -hmm. I was studying computer engineering. Okay which I was pretty good at, yeah. but I hated it. I would be doing my homework and I hate it. Mm -hmm. And then the college I was in, their whole whatever was, it was kind of more like a business college. So okay. whatever your major is, mm -hmm. you at least need to understand the basics mm -hmm. of finances mm -hmm. in the business. Mm -hmm. And I remember I took an introduction to financial accounting class and I fell in love. Mm -hmm. People don't fall in love with accounting. With accounting, yeah. Neither I did. did I. <laughs> I did, and I would actually enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And in my junior year, which mm -hmm. is my third year of college, and I was supposed to be graduating in a year, yeah. I changed my major, which you know drew me back about a year back. Yeah. But that's how I ended up in accounting. I loved it. I yeah. fell in love, and I switched from computer engineering. So, so you accounting. liked computer engineering before you started. But I hated it. Then I, you started no, doing... I was good at it, Yeah. but I hated it. Okay. And you chose computer engineering. Was it out of convenience or was it what you were accepted for? No. It was more from the perspective of, <laughs> whew, what can I convince the embassy that I need to go study <laughs> that is not in Kenya? <laughs> ah, I see. I see. Yes. And, and, and I mean, the States, even now, is... Mm -hmm. is, is, is is a really expensive venture to go in and live and, stu and, and study. Mm -hmm. So how did you raise the capital or the money to be able to, to, so to, to like make I that happen? Say, I have these two amazing parents, and okay. I usually say privilege. Yeah. We, when we all talk about privilege, we yeah. think about it from a money perspective. Yeah. But privilege is so many other things. Mm -hmm. It is having access. Mm -hmm. It's having parents who just support you even when they don't understand Mm -hmm. what it is you're going to do. Mm -hmm. So I remember going to my parents, I'm like, I want to go to the US. And these two amazing human beings who were civil servants, 
had put this money away to start a business uh-huh. and that's what they that's what yes you got to go to the that's US that's what i got to go to the US wow yes that's that's they quite actually were like okay this is what you want yeah. to do yeah and was that money budget. enough um when you're talking about tuition um what do they call it living it wasn't enough yeah. um it was enough for a few semesters uh-huh. And I remember them also sending me a little bit Money. more for upkeep and yeah. whatever. But then, as everyone in the U.S. does, I'm sure you already know this, yeah. I started working. Yeah. Uh, at one time, I remember having three jobs and going to school. Yeah. How much are you being paid at, um, for, for, for these jobs? Minimum wage. I remember my first was job was literally, I think minimum wage, I, I was in St. Louis at the time, mm-hmm. and I think minimum wage was $5.50. An hour. An hour. And how many hours a week are you working at that time? So I worked 36 hours a week. Okay. And then I had another job, which I think my wage was about $7 an hour. Okay. But that was more part-time. I think I worked about 14 hours in that one. Mm -hmm. And then I had another job, which I worked at night, was 40 hours a week Mm -hmm. at $8 an hour. I know. (laughs) So if you're working, you're working 36 hours yes. a week. The other one, you're working 14 so hours a week. So the 36 hours yeah. were days. So it was 12 hour During shifts for three days. Okay. Uh huh. Yes. And then the 14 hour ones you said were part time. That was every night. Every night. The 14 hours was um, I would go in for six hours. I think on the days or more, and then the the full other full time job. Then was that was every night. was every night. <laughs> yeah. So you're and then you're in school at the same time. So yes. you're basically not. Yes. Not 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 sleeping. How long did you? Keep uh, this up it for? didn't keep for so long mm-hmm. because I remember one time coming from one my one job mm-hmm. and driving to school. So I was doing evening classes okay. and falling asleep. Mm-hmm. So I'm on the highway and I'm driving mm-hmm. and I fall asleep. There's traffic. Mm-hmm. It's five o'clock traffic mm-hmm. and there's traffic and I can hear all these horns mm-hmm. behind me. Mm-hmm. Beep, and I wake up. I did not actually realize asleep I'd on the, fallen on, asleep. On the, hi- on the highway. And everyone, uh, you know, the, yes, I stopped because there was traffic. Mm-hmm. But then all the cars in front of me had gone. Have moved. <laughs> Hence the reason the people behind yeah. me are just like, yeah. move. Yeah. So I quit one of the jobs. Okay. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is not this sustainable. Is too much, yeah. I don't want to die. Yeah. I also do like living. Yes. yes. <laughs> so you do two jobs at that point now. Yes, and then I took and two jobs. Mm-hmm. If I'm roughly to do the math, that mm-hmm. looks like about, because um, if you're doing 36 hours at... Five dollars. Yes. That's about um, one hundred and eighty. One hundred and eighty a, a week. week. Yeah. And then which other? One, which, and then which I which still one did you had my eight dollars. The eight dollars. Forty hours a week. So that's yes. another thirty. Uh, thirty. Yeah. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. Yeah, about thirty-two. Something yeah. yeah. So you're doing. You're getting give or take five hundred dollars a, a week. week. Yes. So you're doing about two thousand dollars a month. Yes. Um. Are you, then your parents are sending. Sending you money. And this time I've actually told my parents not to send me money. Not because I'm money. like, it is a lot of money coming from Kenya yeah. to the other side. Right. Especially when your parents don't have it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but your tuition's paid for. Uh, I'm paying tuition. Or you're paying your tuition. Yes. So with this 2000 so how are you breaking down this $2,000? Uh, yo, it worked somehow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm paying tuition. Uh, but remember, tuition is no, it's a semester. Yes. Um. So I'm paying probably about three hundred and sixty dollars. At this time, I was in a community college, okay. which is way cheaper. Yeah. So yeah. I, so I was started at a four-year university, and then I ended up in a community college because they were cheaper. Yeah. To where then and after then two you years, you I can transfer yeah. my credits yeah. to a four-year uh, university. Yeah. And and those are the things you look at your finances and you're like, okay, right now I don't have the money to do a four-year university. It's really expensive. But mm-hmm. if I do a community college and then transfer my credits, which usually transfer. Yeah. Yes. Are you able to save any money at this point? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> you're barely so, living. <laughs> so you're hand, you're hand to mouth Yo, surviving. Yes, yeah. at some point I remember, I, I, I laugh about this story, and I'm like, yeah. I was eating egg and cheese sandwiches. Like, I do not eat, eat egg and cheese sandwiches. Because I because used of to how eat much, them every yeah. day. Not yeah. because I want to, yeah. but it's because it's the only thing I can afford. Did you ever think about coming back? Did the financial yeah. struggle ever get you to the point like that? No, because I was so focused. Mm-hmm. I know I can get to this place. Yeah. And if I do, and for me, giving up is not something I do. It's not an option. That, that word is like, please. Okay, so what I, happens? I can do whatever. So what happens after? So you, oh, but, but I'm assuming then you are saving um, enough to be able to then, when you transfer to the full four-year college, you'd be able to pay the yes. fees there. 
So at some point, I also moved to Atlanta. Okay. Uh, I left St. Louis, I moved to Atlanta. And at this point, it was, I'm not working my new job. So before I left Kenya, mm -hmm. I was a secretary. Okay. So type, I had the basic computer classes, mm -hmm. I have business management, I could file. Mm -hmm. Uh, I make a horrible secretary, by the way. I, <laughs> I am not very good at being told what to do. Yeah. I question everything. Yeah. So I decided I'm going to put these skills to work. Yeah. So when I moved to Atlanta, I decided I'm going to work in an office. Okay. And that was way more money. Okay. And the other thing they did. So mm -hmm. I actually worked mm -hmm. for a Fortune 500 company when I was still in college. I'm like, check, use your skills. Yeah. You're good at this. So I'm like, I'm older, so I'm like, I can file. I have skills I can use. I'm going to go work in an office. Yeah. So did you apply for the jobs? Did you... So I actually went through... In the US, they have this, what they call temporary agencies. Yes. So when yes. I moved to Atlanta, I went to a temp agency. I was called into office. And I'm like, I'm going to do the best job anyone has ever done. Mm -hmm. And that's what people mm -hmm. will get. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to be there for three weeks, actually doing clerical work. Mm -hmm filing and such things. At the end of three weeks, actually my second week, they approached me and they were like, we have a position open. Mm -hmm. We'd like you to take it. And I got it. And guess what that came with? Mm -hmm. Tuition reimbursement. Oh, really? Yes. So, so, so because as the long position, as yeah. I could maintain a B average, which yeah. I maintained way above that. Yeah. They would pay your tuition. They would pay my tuition. They wouldn't pay it. They would reimburse oh, it. Or reimburse it, sorry. Yes, yeah. but that but was... You, so all I needed to come up with was the money for the initial semester. Yeah. And, and then, then once that, I, I have the grade, whatever, they reimburse me, like and a, I use this, that money now yeah, to... Like robbing pe pe to Peter pay. to pay Paul. Exactly. <laughs> like you just keep going. Exactly. And that okay. came with tuition reimbursements, which was a great help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So does that allow you then to begin to save a little money? I'm still not saving. At that I'm point, still you're still making hand to mouth. very little. It's still hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. saving very little. Uh, but at this time, I also have different things. I have 401k. I have all mm -hmm. those other things that I'm contributing to. So yes, it comes with a little bit of saving, but from and different... Yeah. At that point, what was your ambition? Was it to... to Go to the U.S., work in the U.S., live in the U.S., be in the U.S., or are you My going to come back? My ambition was I am going to get a degree. I'm going to graduate. I am going to go in to corporate America, mm -hmm. and I'm going to grow and rise. Okay, so what happens next? So what happens next? I graduate. I get my first job. I start working as an accountant. Okay. I keep rising in the field, working really hard. And then I get a master's. Mm -hmm. um, Keep working, keep rising. I'm assuming when you when you when you now start working as an accountant, you're making a bit more money. Of way more. A little more. How much how yes. much money? Um, equal so at that time, yeah. my first job yeah. as an accountant was sixty thousand dollars a year. Six hundred dollars a year. Yes. Um, to give context, how much money do you would you at that time did you need to make to live comfortably? Um, I probably needed about thirty thousand to live comfortably. So you're making double what? So I'm making a double what I would have needed. Yeah. Okay. And then I start saving. I'm putting mm -hmm. money into my RA. I'm putting mm -hmm. money into, you know, doubling my offer. Any, anything the company is going to match. Okay. Because the U.S. matches. So okay. you put 5%, we'll match 5%. Mm -hmm. so, and that's free money. Mm -hmm. Don't leave it on the table. Yeah. Somebody's giving you free money mm -hmm. for your savings. Mm -hmm. And started putting money towards that. And then just kept rising, worked hard, kept rising in corporate America. I was in Fortune 500 companies and just are you looking rising. at any at that point are you looking at any investments back here yes i am mm -hmm. i am working with my dad who is in real estate he's retired by now actually he was retrenched mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um he's gone into real estate he's telling me about land mm -hmm. and we're also doing that mm -hmm. so we are doing both of those so i'm investing there and i'm also investing here so i'm working with my dad every outcome uh he'll tell me okay this is open this is a land mm -hmm. Are you interested? I'll go see it. And I'm mm. like, yes, let's put my, some money here. Mm. Yep. And, and, and by at this point, how, how old are you at this point? At this point, I'm probably about... When I started really investing in Kenya, I'm about mm. 29, 30. Okay. Yes. And how much... How long had you been working um, as, a, as an accountant by that point? So at that point, I had been working for about six years. Okay. Yes. So you have a, you have a tidy sum. Yeah, saved up. I have a tidy sum, and I'm investing in both spaces. I'm investing here, and I'm investing there. 
Okay. So I'm doing both. Yeah. Because at this time, I haven't decided I'm coming back. Okay, at this time you're still... No, I'm, still I'm like, yo, I'm here. I'm, I'm making this thing work. I'm, yo, I'm living the dream. <laughs> so how do you then make the decision to, to come back if, if you know, everything was good, you're comfortable? I mean, the money seems to be Actually, quite everything a bit. is good. I'm driving a BMW 7 Series. Mm -hmm. Life is good. I own a house. You um, own a house? Yes. How old were you when, when you when you I bought the house? I bought my house. And not an apartment, a house. No, a house. I had a 2,500 square foot house, four bedrooms, three bathrooms. I am 34. 34. How yeah. much was the house? $450,000. <laughs> $450,000. Yes. How much deposit did you pay vis-a-vis? -vis? Usually 20%. 20%. Mm -hmm. And then the rest you were... Yes, wow. and then the rest is, yes. Okay. But in the U.S., you remember your credit score, you know, how you've been paying also yeah. determines yeah. if you're going to get the house or not. Yeah. Yes. And I actually bought this after kind of the financial crisis, um, crisis. mess. Yes. Right. Yeah. Did that affect you at all, actually? No. You know, I was having a, it's interesting, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is also American. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, was, she actually was in Kenya for the last 10 years. Yeah. And she just moved back to the U.S. Okay. And she's American. And mm -hmm. we were talking about it, like, during the financial crisis, I knew it was there. Because mm -hmm. even as business, we needed to go these cuts. Mm -hmm. But if you had a job, you never felt it. Yes, mm -hmm. you know it's happening because mm -hmm. people are losing jobs. It's mm -hmm. everywhere in the news. Mm -hmm. um, you're cost-cutting from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. But from my personal spending, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yes, are you yeah. being more cautious? Yeah. Yes. You weren't afraid of potentially losing your job? Yeah, or? No, no, I wasn't. Mm -hmm. I knew I was pretty good Secure. where I was in the, okay. in the job. And I what, was what job were you? Uh, uh, at, at that, that time, I was actually financial controller mm -hmm. for CBS Radio in Las Vegas. Okay. Yes. And how much is a financial controller CBS Radio making at, at that, that point? At that time, I was making 130000 a year. 130000 a year. Yes. Okay. That's a... That's, that's a that's a good amount of money. Yep. That's a good... And, and, and you would say at that point that's still... Um, basic comfortable living is still at $30,000. Very comfortable because, like, my mortgage was <coughs> $1,200. Mm -hmm. So if I'm making about... I'm taking home after taxes maybe about $10,000 a year. Mm -hmm. My mortgage is about $1,200. Uh, my car is paid off. Mm -hmm. um, at that point. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so and, and you're buying, you're investing with your dad here. Yes. You're investing, um, investing in the there. States with anything that your employer is matching. Yes, anything um, my employer is matching. I also have a different IRA and putting my money in different mutual funds. Okay. Yeah. That's in the States. Yes. But in Kenya, you're purely looking at real Yeah, it was pretty much land. Okay. Yes. And so are you... Bro, uh, maguta, maguta. <laughs> <laughs> or are you, or are you um, buying and building or just buying? Right then, it was just building. Okay. Yes. Just building. Okay. Just buying. Just literally. buying. Literally, not no, no building yet. Okay. Yes, because I'm not here. I'm like, yeah. yeah, let me. I don't even know what's going on in yeah. this market. Yeah. I'm trusting my dad at this point, who okay. is a very a man full of integrity. So I completely trusted him. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So what happens after that? So from financial controller. Um, so then I I remember in 2009 mm -hmm. I came home. Mm -hmm. So I am a child of 1980s. Mm -hmm. We did the mass exodus out of Kenya in the 90s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you realize that yeah. when everyone yeah. was just leaving. Yeah. And at that time, Kenya wasn't in the best of spaces. When you were leaving. Exactly. Yeah. And a lot of us, actually some people have probably never come back. Mm -hmm. So it shocks them when you're telling them you're coming back to Kenya. I'm like, why would you go back? Mm -hmm. And the first time I remember I came home and saw change mm -hmm. was 2009. 2009. Yes. Okay. And I remember going, wait, wow, this could work. Mm -hmm. We could do this. Mm -hmm. And I went back and now started, my brain shifted. Even mm -hmm. though I never went with, I'm going forever mm -hmm. or I'm coming back. Mm -hmm. Some people will go with both. Mm -hmm. Some people go with, I'm going, I'm never coming back. Mm -hmm. Some people go with, I'm going, I'm coming back. Mm -hmm. I was just like, eh. Yeah, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm very good at just letting life flow and mm -hmm. kind of going along with life. Mm -hmm. I don't make finite, I will never do, I won't do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In 2009, I remember coming home and seeing everything going on. What was different? 
everything was different. Yeah. The pace of the country, mm -hmm. the way people were thinking, mm -hmm. the way people were, you know, investing. Everything was different, mm -hmm. which was new mm -hmm. for me. In a Kenyan context. In a Kenyan context. And I was like, wait, you know what? This could work. Mm -hmm. And we're going back and now starting thinking about coming. And I came every year after that. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, I remember coming, and this time I came with a very different mindset. Mm -hmm. I am going to go home and not have fun, because mm -hmm. <laughs> December is all You're about fun. You're coming for holiday. Yo, yeah, it's summer, holiday. Summer bunny. It's, uh, yes, the yeah. summer bunny. Oh, God, I keep saying, I hope <laughs> that's not the way I was when I was a summer bunny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I want to talk to people who have moved back mm -hmm. and are here. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to people who are here mm -hmm. and are in business and have always been here and mm -hmm. I wanted to understand mm -hmm. what is it like yeah and I went back with a commitment to move back in December of 2014 okay so at this point when you're coming back with uh, with uh, this is December 2013 when you're coming back for December 2013 what job or what's your position um, I am right now at the States? financial controller Still a CBS radio, but okay. in a bigger market. Okay. This is in Houston. Okay. So the way radio markets, Kenya is a pretty one country. Mm -hmm. The way radio markets work in the US, mm -hmm. they go by economies. Okay. So I work for CBS, which is a huge corporation, and markets means where the station, the, the company has stations. Right, right. And Las Vegas is market number 32. Okay. Houston is market number five. Okay. You have more visibility. More, You're yeah. making way more money, yeah. which means New York is market number one. Mm -hmm. uh, LA is market number two. Mm -hmm. San Francisco is market number three. Mm -hmm. Chica no, actually, Chicago is market number three. Uh, actually, we're in market number six. Mm -hmm. um, Dallas is market number four. Mm -hmm. uh, no, five. Chica no, San Francisco is five. Dallas is five. Mm -hmm. Houston is six. Mm -hmm. So market number... Uh, if you don't meet your numbers in Las Vegas, yeah. whatever. No, yeah. But if, if you don't in, meet your numbers in, York, in Houston, yes, that's a problem. You know, that's a problem yeah. because your numbers are big. Yeah. So, which means comes with a bigger raise. It's a bigger mm -hmm. market. It's a bigger everything. Mm -hmm. So that's where I am at the time. Okay. And I and come how, home. Uh, what, what increase on salary then do you have at that uh, point? Quite significant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Double. Yes. Triple. Uh, a little over double. A little over double. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And and still, in terms of liabilities, um, they haven't increased. Uh, a little bit of an increase because mm. it's more uh, of an expense. Where I wanted to live is a okay. little bit more expensive. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes. But, but just a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so probably um, over 50, maybe a 60% increase in, yeah. in salary, but maybe a 10% increase in, in expenses. Okay. Yes. And what are you then doing with um, all this So still investing. Yeah. So I'm investing here with my dad in property and I'm upping my investments in the US also. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have the conversation mm -hmm. with the folks who moved back, the folks who are here. Yep. You then... And then I go back and, uh, again, I'm in finance. Mm -hmm. Year-end is coming. So I always needed to leave Kenya by December 31st. Okay. So it always found me on the other side, but I never celebrated it because I'm so jet-lagged. I just okay. came back. Okay. Because on the 2nd, mm -hmm. I need to be at work. Mm -hmm. And I never checked back in into my life. When you so, went back? Yes. So my plan was to come back in December of 2014. Mm -hmm. Early 2014, I go back, can't check back in into my life. None. I'm Is it so because you made the conscious decision to come back? I or? actually, I, I just, I couldn't check in. Yes. Does it every time, and any Kenyan will tell you, anytime they come back, you go back and you probably have a week of the blues. Mm -hmm. You want to be here. Mm -hmm. And then eh, it switches then it goes, back yeah. and life goes on. It, but this time, and never switch back. Mm -hmm. So you're at work and everything, but it's just not... No, it isn't. And I, I didn't even realize how visible it was. So at some point in February, mm -hmm. I remember deciding, I'm leaving, I'm going to mm -hmm. quit. I'm going to test out Kenya. Mm -hmm. Because I, have, I had also never been here mm -hmm. during no more... N a non-holiday period. I came in December. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I need to go to Kenya. But in order for me to be completely... Disengage. Mm -hmm. I need to quit my job. Mm -hmm. I can't have this safety uh, safety net. Safety net. Right. 
However, I am pretty smart. So mm -hmm. my company always did stock options. Okay. Um, at my positions, you'd get stock options, and every year you'd get stock options. Okay. That usually Just, uh, mm -hmm. definition of what stock options. So stock options you. are yeah. you guess if you're working in a publicly traded company yeah. or in the stock exchange here in Nairobi, if you want to yeah. say that way, and gi they give you stocks for a certain amount, but then in the US they always give them a vesting period. Okay. So they vest a certain points mm -hmm. every year, which means after one year, you can cash out mm -hmm. this much. Whether you want to sell them, you want to keep them, mm -hmm. it's, your, it's your choice. Yeah. And that's what the stock options meant. Yeah. And I knew I had all these stock options vesting. Mm -hmm. um, I had been with a company at the time for about eight years. Mm -hmm. So I had them vesting at different periods. And mm -hmm. I remember, hey, you don't leave money on the table. Yeah. This is free money. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, okay, I have uh, stocks vesting in February and I had stocks vesting in April. Okay. I'm like, I'm not going to be give my resignation <laughs> until, <laughs> until, <laughs> until I have that vesting <laughs> happening. <laughs> then I have my yeah. money then you can... Then I can give my resignation. Okay. And that's what I did. So the okay. decision was made in February. But I remember I was stocks vesting in February, stocks vesting in March, and stocks vesting in April. Mm -hmm. I think April 2nd. Mm -hmm. So when I... And you have a, you have a portal yeah. where you can go see mm -hmm. transferred to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. April 4th, I remember walking to my boss's office and says, I need to talk I'm to done. you. <laughs> She's like, you're leaving. I didn't realize mm -hmm. that my checked outness was so, was so visible. Yeah. She actually told me, you're leaving. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. And she told me, I should never have let you go to Kenya in December. <laughs> 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 yeah. Okay. And then I came back. How do you deal with the liabilities at that point when you're, when you're moving back? Which liability? The, the house. Um, I put my house for rent. Okay. So you so, still, you, so you kept the so house. So I still have the house. Even uh, now you still have the house. I ended up selling it, mm -hmm. um, but got a property manager. Yeah. Put my house out for rent. Yeah. And good thing, one of my former uh, uh, co-workers mm -hmm. at CBS Radio in Las Vegas mm -hmm. wanted to, remember the house has already been for rent. Yes. I had already moved from Las Vegas to Houston. Yes. Uh, exactly. Right, right, so it's right, already right, up right, for rent. Right. I have a property manager managing the property. Right. Uh, and I moved back. I put everything in storage. I packed three suitcases because mm -hmm. shoes need their own suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> and I come home. And so what's the plan? So the plan is I'm here for two months. Mm -hmm. I actually had a return ticket. Okay. Uh, I'm here for two months. I want to see how Kenya works on a regular month. Basis. Yeah. When just people are here. And then you come back and your phone doesn't ring. Mm -hmm. And when you're here in December, everybody's looking for you. Yeah. You're like, what? You even call your, my parents live in Akuru, like I yeah. said. And I call, I remember one weekend, one Friday calling my mom. And I'm like, I'm coming on Saturday. And she's like, mm -mm, don't come this Saturday. We have plans. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> come the next one. Come the next month. Yeah. And then it happens and we start going through and doing the dance and networking. How, how difficult is that for you psychologically and emotionally? It's actually cool quite hard mm -hmm. because you had a real life mm -hmm. and you've had these friends in Kenya who you've stayed in touch with mm -hmm. but this is also and, and, and sometimes you come to actually realize about the people and who you are as a people mm -hmm. as Kenyans we're very cautious mm -hmm. because we've been burnt a lot mm -hmm. So you realize, even though when you're here and you're just meeting for coffee for dinner you're just here for three weeks they're all open now yeah. when you're here hundred yeah. percent, People hang out with you on a weekday, but on the weekend, yeah. they haven't let you in yet because mm. that's the real friends and real fun mm. time. So that took a little bit of adjusting. Uh, <laughs> I remember this friend of mine called Dungo, and I laugh about it because I think every Sunday I would call him and tell him I'm leaving. Yeah, because you were just like... Every Sunday. So you're not, enjoy you're not enjoying the environment, you're not mm, enjoying the place. I was, but at the same time, it was, I had a life. Yes. I had friends. Yes. And I've come here probably these people are people and I, you know, there's something I'm going to tell you. I tell only very close people do yes. I see about this and I'm, this podcast is out there being viewed by people yeah. probably thinking about coming back. Yeah. I'm very organized. Mm -hmm. When I left the US, I had a list mm -hmm. of 47 people. 47 people? Yes. That, that you I was going to come and guess how many of those are still in my life? Right now? How many years later? This is 20... About eight Fif years 15 later. 15 to now. 2014 to now. Um, 
I don't know, maybe 20? Three. Three. And one of them actually doesn't count because he's my first cousin. <laughs> like, good. <laughs> you Your have family. No <laughs> you have no choice. So you had a list of 47 people uh -huh. that you would frequent. I thought and I would have, come uh, and call them and would have this relationship. And community and, and community everything. And three. And like I say, one, one of them so is my first two. cousin. So it's really two. I'm like, dude, you have no choice. You have to talk to me. You're my first cousin. Our moms are sisters. <laughs> Your family. That must, have been, that must have been really challenging. And you don't realize that. But it's nothing wrong. Some of these people are high school friends. Yeah. have been gone for 16 years. Mm. What creates relationships? It's shared experiences. Yeah. We haven't shared any experiences. In 16 years, other than this Everyone has visitor. moved on. You know, you left, you went to university, you got a job, you took different paths, you got married, you got divorced, you have children, you don't. You don't have anything shared. Mm. You have nothing. So you meet for coffee and you're literally like, uh, okay. There's, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing to, to talk about. Really. There's nothing to talk about. Yeah. And it's not a fault on their part or my part. Yeah. It's just life happened. And at this time, um, have, you, have you bought a house here? Are you renting a house here? So at this time, actually, mm, look, I, I organized things. Yeah. When I first moved, I actually had found uh, a volunteer. Okay. NGO. Okay. Of the UK, based out of the UK, they do volunteering NGO around the world. Mm -hmm. And I found one and I was coming, I came in as a volunteer CFO in Kenya. Mm -hmm. they, were, they are not paying me a mm -hmm. salary, uh -huh. but they're giving housing. Okay. And they're giving me a stipend. Okay. Which means my savings is untouched. Or is untouched. How big is that stipend for your, <laughs> for your savings to be untouched? Right. Like, I'm in Nairobi, housing is paid. Yeah. And I have 8K. In a stipend yeah. for food and whatever else and whatever else and have, have, you, have, you, import, doesn't have you imported housing. your car from from the states i or have, have not brought my car yeah. so at this point i also got really lucky one of the people who has actually become my best friends mm -hmm. worked in this ngo and mm -hmm. we lived very close to each mm -hmm. other in kilileshwa mm -hmm. so she'd actually pick me up in the morning mm -hmm. we go to work and she'd drop me off in the evening mm -hmm. yeah and at some point, I'm like, okay, but I need to run around, especially when I have multiple errands. And I think it came to a point where I'm like, I think there's a time I paid, I think it was 7,000 in Uber, in taxis. It was actually not Uber yet. Yeah. It was just taxes. Here, 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 here. See, tax is fine when you're point A, point B, yeah. done. But when you have to go to multiple places, yeah, and that time I'm like, mm, I need to buy a car. Yeah. But, and I had cash. Yeah. So I went, you found a car, bought it for cash. Yeah. Same car I still have. To date. To date. What car is that? Oh, we're not talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but it's eight years. I mean, it's eight I, years. It's not I, like... I call it my... It goes <laughs> everywhere. Now I'm a manufacturer. It yeah. carries things. You can't even see so, anything. Okay, can you assume it's a pickup truck? It's not a pickup truck. No, I want a pickup truck. Okay. It, uh, it has gone everywhere in this country. Yeah. I'm going to laugh because uh, my brother, before he left for Germany, he had this car and he used to call it, it was a Toyota, and he called okay. it Ratchet. Yes. So I asked him, why do you call it Ratchet? He's like, because it goes everywhere and it's cheap. <laughs> 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 so I'm just about to call my car Ratchet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it goes everywhere. Okay. And it's cheap. And it's cheap. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. tell me, so how long do you do the volunteering? And it's at what point does... Um, the businesses then, then come into play? So I volunteer for about three months. Mm -hmm. And then during that three months, I'm here and I'm meeting again. Like I said, the people had 47 in my list. Yeah. Three of them in my life. But still, I ended up meeting these amazing people mm -hmm. along the way from networks I had made. Yeah. Some of them networks I had made 15 years earlier. Yeah. And I, I, I talk about this. I'm not good at networking. Mm -hmm. What I'm good at is building relationships. And I think that's how it should What's be. What's the difference? The difference is networking people go into it looking that this person is going to help you in the future. Mm. No. Where are they going to help you? Relationship building is actually creating a real human mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. That this person feels if you ever reach out to them. It's not about. It's not about they the can do for help. You. It is about there's a connection. I care yeah. about this person. Yeah. And because I care, yeah. 
I will put my foot forward and help. Yeah. So we all go into networking and you exchange cards and you think because you, you met this person one in. time yeah. and you had one good conversation and you think the next time you're going to call them, they're going to show up for you. Yeah. Why? Do you know how many people are calling them? Mm. Create relationships, real ones, yeah. real human connections. Yeah. And I ended up building and I remember a friend of mine said, oh, by the way, I have this recruiter. Uh, this is Kenyans mm -hmm. come home. Mm -hmm. And reach out to them. And at this point, I'm like, yeah, I think I can stay. I've pushed my ticket so many times oh, by so, now. Oh, yes, because it was a two-month <laughs> ticket. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I keep pushing it, like, every yeah. week yeah. until I just canceled it. Yeah. I was like, okay, I'll explore this. And I meet with them. And they tell me they have a role. Mm -hmm. And for CFO mm -hmm. of a retail pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. It's actually Good Life. Mm -hmm. And Good Life had just gotten money from Catalyst. Mm -hmm bought Mimosa, mm -hmm. and they needed a CFO with international experience, experience yeah. and private equity money, and then I ended up getting the role. So I did the two, so I got a job, started working the CFO, I'm still volunteering, mm -hmm. and then hired someone to transition now into the NGO role, okay. and then I fully Fully transitioned. Let me ask yeah. you this. Mm -hmm. um, the money that you were making in the States... Um, my assumption, I may be wrong, and you may correct me if I'm wrong, but my assumption that the money that you were making then was a lot more than the money you're making now, even as a CFO at... I actually love that at, question. At, at, at Good Life. Yes. So one, one is that true? Mm -hmm. Two, um, do you have to adjust um, your expectations or your um, value-based, um, uh, what do you call it? I guess how you value yourself um, based off of what um, Good Life is now offering you. Okay. I'm going to address the value for self. Yeah. I never value myself based on money. Yeah. Ever. For me, it's, it's you make money, you lose money. It's a factor of life. It allows you to do amazing things. And I think if you peg your value on money, yeah. you're going to live a really frustrated and whatever life. Yeah. I, va I value my life on what I'm able yeah. to deliver to the world. And, yeah. and if I am happy, and that's very important to me. Yeah. Yes. How did, did I, you, how did you get to that realization? You know, these things I keep telling you, I, I've never cared. Mm -hmm. And I like I said, I love nice things. I've never lied about that. Yeah. I love good things. Mm -hmm. And money allows me to get those things. But I am this person who can go to the bottom. Like I said, I am from, I grew up in the village, mm -hmm. in a crew. Yes, was I at the bottom? No. But I can go, I have farmed, mm -hmm. actually. I proudly say my mother's beautiful kitchen was built by tomatoes I farmed the mm -hmm. year I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. So I can go to the very bottom. So yeah. I can be in that village, and if you go there, they will tell you that. Yeah. Anna never has ass. Yeah. However, I also have dollar millionaires in the U.S. with private jets who are my friends. Mm -hmm. In a four-day weekend, I can do Aspen, Cabo, and Las Vegas mm -hmm. on a private jet. Mm -hmm. And all of it is me. Because the value of money it is the people that allow me to do what they need to do. Mm -hmm. So do I value myself around money? No. Do I love money? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because it allows me to do what I love to do. Mm -hmm. And did I make less a good life? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But here's a kicker. Mm -hmm. And this is what I tell anyone who is trying to lo relocate back. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks at that package. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm going to be making less. I saved more. Mm -hmm. How so? My expenses were so low. Mm -hmm. Very, very low. So I had a car paid off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I lived on Riverside. Mm -hmm. My rent was $7,500 shillings. shillings. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I'm living by myself, so my grocery bill is pretty low. <laughs> the... Expenditure. Mm -hmm. I also, you also have this rich life, mm -hmm. which is a social life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. you don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I had a bad day at work. Mm -hmm. 
I can find three friends who are willing to go and have a cup of coffee and yeah. hang out and laminate, yeah. la- lament. Oh my God, my day was yeah. horrible. It was like this and yeah. whatever. Had a cup of coffee in the US. I had a bad day at work. I went shopping. Mm. I went to Dostrom mm. and I went to Saks <laughs> and I shopped. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Retail therapy. Yeah. So I saved more, which ended up with me investing more. Yeah, in more real estate. Okay. So I'm making less. Yes. But I'm actually, I actually have more money. More, more cash. In, more in, cash. In your hand. Yes. Let me ask and this and then the, there's this thing in the US, like I said, you go shopping and you spend money on your credit card yeah. and then come the end of the month and you have to pay it off. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask this for, for any potential or any people thinking about getting into the CFO space. Mm-hmm. What, you know, the other day I was reading the, I saw in the newspaper, I think it was a business daily that was covering um, the salaries for um, Kenyan bank CEOs, um, uh, the, big, the, the big banks, and I think all of them were at the minimum, like 20 something million uh, uh, a month, if I'm not wrong. That's excluding bonuses. So um, I'm, I'm wondering, um, at a CFO level um, in this country, what are people making? We've had what doctors make, we've had what um, bankers make to some level, um, we've had what chefs make as well, and we've had what rugby players make. Um, so I'm curious, at, at, at a CFO level in this country, what, what is someone making? It's a, one of the most frustrating things mm-hmm. because even when you're trying to negotiate a salary, mm-hmm. it's hard to bank. Mm-hmm. In the US, I could tell you, depending on the city I was in, mm-hmm. I can tell you what that's supposed to be. Yeah. Here. In this market, it will range mm-hmm. anywhere from two hundred thousand, two hundred a month, yeah, to five million, and everything in between. It's the worst market to negotiate a salary because you don't know. So, what I usually say, mm-hmm. if you're nego- negotiating a salary, peg your value. Mm-hmm. And I'm very good at pegging value. Mm-hmm. What is your value? Mm-hmm. This is my value. Mm-hmm. This is what I want. Because think about navigating that spread. Mm-hmm. It's pretty big. 20,000 yeah. 20, to 5, to million. five that's, million. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. Yeah. It and you could be you're doing the same, the same role. It, it depends yeah. now on company size yeah. and all that. But it's not the role. Yeah. Yeah. It's the value that you, you, you bring to the company. It, it, yes. So you look at the value and you look at... So as a CFO, if you're coming to Waidera Beauty, mm-hmm. I don't have five million to pay you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> However, yeah. if you're going to one of the big banks, yeah. they, may. they may. So those are the things you need to at. take a look at. Okay. Yes. So how then do you um, transition from CFO at Good Life to then um, Waidera Beauty? So I knew when I was coming back that I wanted to go into business. Mm-hmm. I believed it was time for us to tell our own stories. Mm-hmm. So often, we have let other people tell our stories as mm-hmm. Africans. Mm-hmm. And I had received amazing mentorship mm-hmm. along the way. And I'm so passionate about this continent mm-hmm. and this country, even though I feel like I'm in an abusive relationship. With a country. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. However, I wanted to come back and do a business, but mm-hmm. I didn't know what yet. Mm-hmm. Because again, a lot of us coming back, we make this mistake and we think, I'm going to come back and do this because it exists. Yeah. You first need to come and learn mm-hmm. the market yeah. and the place yeah. and the gaps. What do they want? Because I could decide to transition whatever I may think would work from... Australia or the UK or the US or India or whatever. Yeah. But when I come back here, it's not what you want. Yeah. So I came. Mm-hmm. And as I'm looking around, I actually had another business idea that mm-hmm. I ended up shelving. shelving. I never say it went. And those are the things you have to be ready to do. Yeah. Sometimes the market isn't just ready. Mm-hmm. So at this business idea, the market isn't ready. It's still not ready. Mm-hmm. And if I had gone to business with that, it yeah, would have. It would have failed. Yeah. And started looking around, and I love beauty. Mm-hmm. I, uh, 
I just do. And I love yeah. nice things. Yeah. And uh, like I usually say, I'm a tomboy who loves everything beauty and fashion. Yeah. And I started looking around. I was very, very keen on coming and supporting local business yeah. when I moved back. Yeah. But when I'm looking around for beauty, there was very little. And I even expanded. It's mm -hmm. like by African. Mm -hmm. Not just by Kenyan, by mm -hmm. African. Mm -hmm. But even that was very little. Mm -hmm. And the imported products, you're looking at the price. And remember, I know the cost. Of what it takes to make yes. yes. Not even what... No, at that time, I do yeah. not know the cost of making. Mm -hmm. I know the costs there. Oh, right. So I'm right. looking at it. It costs this much in the US. It's $20 in the US. Where are they asking for $70? Mm. 70, whatever. 7,000. 7,000, 8,000 Kenya shillings. Like, what? Yeah. No, I don't want to buy a shop. I, ju yeah. I just want one product. And I did what a lot of us do. And actually, even, you know, we send people when we travel. We... Yeah, ask them to bring, bring. stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, and then I started thinking about it. And I'm like, why can't we? A lot of these ingredients, mm -hmm. the raw material is actually coming from here. Mm -hmm. So decided to go out and create a brand mm -hmm. for women and affordable, mm -hmm. but comparable to actually same standards as the international standards. Yeah. And that's where the journey began. So, mm -hmm. What were the startup costs? So startup costs, Course, I think we started with about four million mm -hmm. Kenya shillings dollars. Four, four million, million Kenya shillings, sorry. Four million shillings, yeah. Yes, but as we grow, there's always money coming in. We're in manufacturing, yeah. we're in product development. Yeah, it's a very very expensive venture. Yeah, which means if you're going into manufacturing and you're looking to make money, your second, third, no. Mm -hmm. um, you don't start making money in manufacturing at about f fifth, sixth seventh year. And this is the reason why. Mm -hmm. To grow in manufacturing, you need to keep introducing new products. Mm -hmm. And as you're introducing these products, uh, just even the product development costs, mm -hmm. the formulation costs, mm -hmm. just taking it to market, the marketing costs, the packaging costs, the development of it, your existing products are mm -hmm. not making enough to, to support it. Yeah. They're making enough to cover themselves, mm -hmm. but not a new product. Mm -hmm. Which means you're always you're still coming out of pocket. Money. Yes, yeah. yes. So then, I mean, because you you said you're in your sixth year now. Yes, so going on six. Going going on six. Yeah. So how then do you survive um, as as a human being? How are you meeting your costs if if um, you know you're not making money through through those um, um, four four to six years? And I've, actually, I talk about this about as you're starting out, having another source of income. Mm -hmm. Because I think sometimes where we trip up is, I do not have the money to keep developing this. And I still need to eat mm -hmm. from this business. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a business, but I still need to live. Mm -hmm. And if I'm expecting this business to pay me to live, mm -hmm. it's not there yet. Mm -hmm. I have a skill I can sell. Mm -hmm. I'm still in finance. Mm -hmm. I have that skill. Mm -hmm. So I consult. Quite mm. a bit. So I will mostly have consultancy gigs here and there. I'll take a project, uh, charge for it, get paid. So that's where we have kept things going. Yeah. So two ways that me consulting, us staying on top of our finances. So meaning when it came for us to buy equipment, mm -hmm. NCBA financed us for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But that also means having good keeping records, having mm -hmm. good finances, having good books mm -hmm. that a bank and compliancy, compliance, which the bank feels comfortable coming mm -hmm. to fund you. So between me consulting and NCBA giving us equipment financing yeah. and also a stock loan, meaning mm -hmm. if I need raw materials mm -hmm. and we don't have the cash right now, mm -hmm. I can draw on it, mm -hmm. buy the raw materials I need mm -hmm. and then pay the bank over time. Over time. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. How much would you say then that you've, you've put into the business? Not taking ah, out, but ah, how much ah. you've put into the business over the six years? About six years, about right now, about $60,000. About six thousand dollars. Sixty. Sixty thousand dollars. Yes. That's a tidy. Is that why you sold the house? No. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the reason I yeah. sold the house yeah. is it's really difficult to manage real estate when you're not there. Mm, okay. It's just. It gets messy. 
and and during during this period the six year period are you uh-huh. then investing in other things or are you then primarily no, investing I'm in the business no i'm still investing in other things yeah. um i'm still investing in other things so um, the money that you're making I'm from the consulting is allowing investing, you i'm solely investing yeah and also investing in other things in the silaire and the stock market um still in real estate which actually some of that real estate has come very handy because as we all know especially as a I try not to use this as a, because I don't feel as a woman entrepreneur I'm mm-hmm. any different than a man yeah, entrepreneur. Right, right. However, there comes this place where the bank is asking you for collateral yes. because the bank is not just going to give you money. Yeah. And a lot of women founders never usually have collateral. Mm. At least the men have advantage from mm. that perspective. So even though the bank is giving me money for business, mm. I still have to put on my personal collateral. Mm. So this real estate is that what? I used to whatever with when I was away with my father, is yeah. what is coming to, you know, get there to help me get the funds to get do what the you funds need to, do. to do what I need to do yeah. for the business. Did you ever look for outside investment? I now we are ready because mm-hmm. there is also this thing that everybody thinks they need to go look for outside investment, but you have to realize as an entrepreneur uh, because a lot of fall prey to this. When are you ready? When is the right time? Uh, sometimes we go for it way too early. Mm-hmm. And we end up giving way too much for too little. Mm-hmm. And you end up so stressed. And sometimes you can end up losing the business. So you have to know the right time to go find money. Yeah. So my strategy is I have a valuation level I need to get to for my business before I go you looking go for outside money. money because I want to be able to call the shots. Yeah. I want to be able to go to the investor and yeah. go, this is yeah. what I'm bringing to the table. This is what I'm offering. This is what I want. Yeah. When you go in desperate, you have no negotiating power. Yeah. And that's something as an entrepreneur, you need to be very, very careful of. Yeah. And that's why a lot of us fall prey. I was talking to a friend of mine. Like There's a lot of companies that are folding at mm-hmm. the moment because they took investor money, but couldn't pay it back. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about this conversation. She's also an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And we're talking about it, and everybody talks about private equity being the devil. Mm-hmm. But they come and lay everything on the table. Mm-hmm. They've told you what they want. But as entrepreneurs, sometimes we're so desperate, and we take the money without really reading the fine print. Yeah. So my advice is usually do not take money yeah. when you're desperate. Yeah. If you can have something you can sell, if you have yeah. a skill you can sell, yeah. whatever it is you've do been that. doing yeah. before, do that. Fund it. Is it exhausting? Oh, yeah. yes, every day. Um, I work 24 hour hours a day sometimes yeah. because I work my business and then I mm, need to go consult. consult. <laughs> Yeah. However, for me, I have peace of mind. Yeah. I can make decisions. I can move the, you know, move different the business different ways. Yeah. I have no investor breathing down my neck. Yeah. So take money when you really understand your business. Yeah. And know the value that your business holds. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let me ask you. I guess as we sort of wind up, mm-hmm. what's the most difficult financial day you've ever had? I mean, because it sounds like, you know, I mean, well, not, I wouldn't say rosy, but it sounds like, I mean, like, you've, you've had money. <laughs> you've had money. You've not really lacked. So my question is, what's the most difficult financial day you've had? Every day. Outside of, outside of, outside of um, um, uh, working in the, working the three, four jobs in the States. I, now, in business. Yeah. So I came from the person who would go... Sunday, every Sunday, and I'm with my friends at the tribe for a spa and mm-hmm. then do brunch. And to, whoa, there's brunch. I can't afford it. If you're ready to come for a potluck at my house, we yeah. can do that, but yeah. no, I can't afford brunch. And that sometimes is hard. Mm-hmm. And when you peg your value to money, mm-hmm. that becomes more difficult mm-hmm. when you're an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And I say every day is a juggle because every day I have a list of people who need to get paid. Yeah. And I have to juggle it because 
and especially right now with people not paying me. Yeah. It's okay. Who do I need to pay? What do I need? Like right now, I'm looking at I need this, I need this, I need this. So I'm like, okay, I need bottles. They're coming from China. I need to pay this. I need to pay the exp whatever. I need to pay the clearing for them. Uh, and then I need to pay this person because, yeah, we need rent. That mm -hmm. has to be paid. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're going to be kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and for me, that helps. Having come from a financial background, mm -hmm. it helps to be able to balance mm -hmm. those things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, sometimes it's really difficult, especially when you're, I need raw materials, but we can't go into production because we don't have cash. And then we lie in this very intricate position of we are a small business. We're mm -hmm. still a small business, mm -hmm. which means my customers accept credit, expect credit from me. Yeah. My suppliers want me to pay them cash. Yeah. There's no have credit a gap. there. Yeah. I haven't been paid, but I need raw materials. Yeah. It's the bane of our existence every day that yeah. you're calling your supplier and begging to get paid yeah. for so goods that's... you've supplied <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that are way past due yeah. and they have sold yeah. because they are requesting more yes. so you know they've sold. Yeah. Because so what do you do in that instance? Uh, you become the queen or queen of sweet tongues mm -hmm. and talking your way through. Because remember, even they have a list of people they need to pay. Yeah. So it comes to... But so then who's, who, who's then messing up in that value chain? Because if... It's no one actually. In this, yes. Is there sometimes someone is messing up in this value chain? Yes. But sometimes no one is messing up mm -hmm. in the value chain. Mm -hmm. It's just the... So where's well, the money? Because, I mean, it's, it's money. So where's the money? So let me give you an example. Yeah. Even us, we, call, we all call ourselves manufacturers in this country. We are all manufacturers. Mm -hmm. However, I need to import a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Right? At this exchange rate right now, mm -hmm. the last, ex last week, you know how much I, the, my exchange rate was mm -hmm. negotiated mm -hmm. in dollars? Mm -hmm. 142.8. 142. Point eight, almost one forty-three. Are you passing this cost onto the consumer? I can't in this market pass all of it. No one will buy because even the consumer is struggling. Mm -hmm. I don't sell bread. Yeah. Actually, even bread people might even decide, "Yo, <laughs> I don't need that." A little yeah. galia yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So we've but how far do you increase prices? Yeah. And we, some of us are starting, it hasn't affected us yet, but I've been, you know, a lot of, talked to a lot of small manufacturers because that's how we keep ourselves going, just checking on each mm -hmm. other. Some of them have seen real drop in sales, but the increase of price. Mm -hmm. So it is this balance of, yes, your margin just keeps getting smaller and smaller. Getting smaller. But as long as I'm not making a loss, and this is where it helps me being a financial person is like, okay, the minute I start not making money, at least not even covering my whatever, you, mm -hmm. it's been real. Mm -hmm. This is no longer mm -hmm. a business. Mm -hmm. And that's where sometimes it's challenging. Mm -hmm. And that's where, as much as I love this country with everything I've got, and as that much the business started as being an African business, mm -hmm. that's the reason we've diversified into mm -hmm. the U.S. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to keep that shock at least a From, little bit yeah. absorbed. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second last question. Mm -hmm. um, do you regret moving back? No. No. Not You'd still do it the exact same Do way? I have moments of... <laughs> <laughs> that one, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but for the most part, no. Yeah. I say I have never done something more fulfilling, mm -hmm. but more frustrating mm -hmm. at the same mm -hmm. time. And I would, I would not choose anything else. Yeah. So in that moment, when I am sitting in my office and... I look at my team and we're creating livelihoods because that's one of the reasons we decided to manufacture in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So for me, creating financial independence mm -hmm. and empowerment, especially for women, mm -hmm. 
is very, very important. Mm -hmm. It's a passion of mine. Mm -hmm. So we all talk about financial, we, we talk about women empowerment. All of us throw that word around. Mm -hmm. But I come back to you cannot empower a broke woman. If she's broke, she's not empowered. Yeah. So we manufacture in Kenya because I believe we need to create wealth. Mm -hmm. And the only reason no country has ever developed without manufacturing, yeah. without industry. So create industry, create employment, create a bigger ripple, employ women. 85% of our employment is women. Okay. They're empowered. I see them. They create a ripple. They're happy. That gives me joy and that tells me we are doing something right. Yeah. When I see, I'm out there in an elevator, I'm a zucchini buying vegetables, whatever, and someone comes up to me and like, oh my God, we love your products, you're empowering us. It keeps me going. So I have no regrets. Yeah. And I could always go back. I, I do the back <laughs> and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So me being here is a choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And no regrets. No none. regrets at all. Huh? Do I have moments? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. I wouldn't be human if I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Last thing. Mm -hmm. Anything? A tip? Um, actually, no. Worst financial decision you've made? Could be a purchase. Could be... A con could be. Can I think about it? That's fine. Yeah. No, I'm sure. Oh. Huh. Worst financial decision I ever made. When I first moved back, mm -hmm. a relative approached me and they told me they had uh, a deal mm -hmm. in Sudan. They wanted onions mm -hmm. and there was a market. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. And I gave them several millions to go do this deal. Of course, it ended up being a yes. You lost all of it. Of course. That is. <laughs> <laughs> What's the lesson there? The lesson there is, uh, which is, I think, the reason, I, which is usually something I would do. And I, I, we, fall, we all fall prey to this yeah. one, especially when someone very close to you, yeah. especially a relative, comes to you. Yeah. Um, and even though there's a voice in the back, and you know the right thing to do is do your due diligence, yeah. you still don't because you feel like you're letting them down. Yeah. Yeah. So, and what do you do after you've lost that kind of money? Get over it. It's gone. You can't sit there and... Wallow. Wallow. I also don't believe in wallowing. Yeah. So, look, money is gone. Move on. Find other ways to make money. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I hope to get to the point where I can lose millions and make uh, money is gone. <laughs> and that's the thing. You, yes, I, could I sit there and wallow and be depressed? Yeah. yeah. But how is that helping me? Yeah. It isn't. And I am blessed to have this positivity, like, yo, it's, I'm a realist. Yeah. It's gone. Can't do anything about it. Yeah. Yo, did it hurt? Yeah. However, you have to let's move. find a way forward. Okay. Thank you so much. I think um, I've learned a totally different perspective from, um, one, how much money people are making in the States, to um, just relocating and the process of that journey. Um, adjusting a little bit about the manufacturing space. I think it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, obviously, tune in for the next episode.